Welcome back to Chips and Salsa, where we talk security at Intel. I'm Jerry. I'm Priya, and today we are excited to have researchers from ETH Zurich on the talk show about that, their new research paper they just published. Yeah, we spent a lot of time in collaboration with these folks to disclose this issue through Intel SA01247. So let's bring them on to discuss the research. Hi, uh, um, thanks for coming into our show. Uh, please introduce our, yourself and uh, give uh, what field of study that you do in ETH Zurich. Hey, uh, thanks for having us. I'm uh, Sandro Reke. I'm at the Electrotechnical Department at ETH Zurich, and I do research in transient execution vulnerabilities and defense. And uh, my name is Johannes, and I am... Um, I'm also from the same research group, or I actually recently graduated a few months ago um, from uh, the ComSec group at ETH Zurich, um, where I worked uh, together with uh, Sandro. And uh, yeah, my, my thesis is on uh, uh, speculative execution with a particular focus on return target prediction. But uh, in, in this case, it's not uh, only about returns. And also a lot of the works were also not only about returns, but the return prediction is, uh, has, has been a, a, a recurring theme of my research. But Before we get started on your paper, how did you guys get into this particular field of study? What led you uh, to this point? So um, I can start, I guess. So when I was doing my master's, um, uh, I, um, it was back in 2017-18. So uh, I had to do like a semester project. And at the, conveniently enough, that was the same time as the Spectre Meltdown papers came out. So, uh, and, and I was doing system security at the VU Amsterdam. And uh, uh, it seemed uh, to be... Uh, uh, an interesting choice then to go into speculative execution. So then I did a semester uh, project in that, and then uh, that evolved into a master thesis project, and then um, and then from one thing to another, and then yeah, I've just been uh, doing speculative execution research. Awesome. Yeah, and I've always just been fascinated uh, learning about security vulnerabilities of software in in the news. And then one day I learned that hardware can also be broken and uh, have bugs um, because hardware is this weird, mysterious box that you don't see inside and that magically does cool stuff. Uh, it just made the whole uh, security research so much cooler, cooler and that's uh, how I got into it. Awesome. Can you give us a high-level overview of the branch privilege injection paper? Yes, should I start? <laughs> yeah, so uh, I think the, the listeners of this channel are, are technical viewers, right? So, but, but shortly, we're, we're concerned with Spectre here, and modern CPUs speculate about the future to make programs run faster. And one way in which processors speculate is about branch targets, um, for example, for indirect, uh, indirect function calls, uh, virtual, virtual uh, functions. And the processor would speculate where this instruction would go next before knowing for sure. And with this, you can trick the CPU into leaking some secret. Um, this issue has been known already since 2018. And Intel introduced a mitigation in subsequent hardware called EIBRS. There were some other mitigations in between, but this seems to be the final solution you settled on, if I understand correctly. And um, earlier we said that attackers want to control the predicted target of an indirect branch in these attacks. And what this mitigation now does, it separates the prediction mechanism for different uh, security domains. And an unprivileged user process should not be able to control the predictions for a privileged program like the kernel. Um, yeah, this mitigation has held its ground quite well, and there have not been any attacks injecting targets from one privilege level into the other uh, directly until now. But maybe Johannes can tell you what we do in the paper to actually circumvent this mitigation. Uh, yeah, so there has been yeah there, there's been something similar like which is this branch history injection, which is uh, exploiting the fact that branch history is shared across. Uh, uh, privileges uh, or privileged domains, but in this case, it's like um, 
it's more of um seems to be more a uh, a uh, bug or a race condition where predictions new predictions that are coming in from uh, retired branch instructions are queued up to be added to the branch predictor and those predictions seems to not be associated with the privilege domain that they come, that they uh, came from so if there's a privilege switch while a new prediction is queued to be committed to the branch prediction uh, structures um those predictions will be added with whatever the current privilege domain is um and it also uh, um uh affects other things, not only the EIBRS, uh, for example, when there is a branch prediction barrier, uh, which uh, invalidates branch, uh, indirect branch uh, target predictions. Uh, if there are already uh, indirect branch predictions queued to be added, so retired indirect branches right before a branch prediction barrier, those will get added uh those might get th those may still be in the queue after the ibpb is finished and will then be added so um there is uh some uh, uh a, a kind of a race condition going on yeah I, i'd imagine uh this is pretty complex what what were some of the toughest challenges you ran into while doing this research um i could say something about so actually when i originally i stumbled upon um this uh, weird behavior um where uh, it looked like occasionally uh, branch predictions from from the other privileged domain were used in the in the more in a in a different privileged domain uh but it was not happening i i am um, It had originally had no idea what, what that it had to do with when a previous transition occurs in respect to when the new branch were allowed. Uh, additionally, we also didn't know that it came from um, the BTB or the instruction pointer based branch predictor. And so when uh, so I had this weird effect, and every time I tried to make that experiment more understandable, the it would break down. And so we had, it was unclear whether it even was a, um, it, whether this was some kind of prefetching going on or if this was actually um, a branch misprediction. And that's, uh, so, so at that point, uh, uh, I handed the project over to Sandro. And <laughs> I don't know what he did, but he figured some things out. <laughs> Yeah, but the thing is, rate conditions are inherently difficult because uh, we're doing black box testing and we don't know that the, it is a race condition uh, at all. And we, even if we knew, we didn't know what things are racing. So uh, that sometimes makes you believe that you're just hallucinating and what you're observing is not actually real. Um, yeah, uh, that, that's what made it uh, difficult to, to get into. Well, thanks for uh, uh, giving that back to us and allowing us to mitigate it. What was it like to collaborate with Intel? Uh, it was good to have. Um, uh, so we ended up having a more direct communication channel rather than using PGP encrypted emails, which has to go through first through the PCER team, then then via them to, to the engineers, and then back and forth. And 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 if they had like a more direct communication channel, and I think that was made things a lot faster and easier. Yeah. So I mean, <clears throat> from our side, it was great. Intel responded promptly. Uh, you acknowledged the issue. You confirmed that we are the first to report it, actually, which is always uh, relieving, also for us, that we are not the hundredth person to find it. <laughs> um, <laughs> and we experienced the communication as constructive. As uh, you understand, this direct channel was great for us, so we could ask you or if we found something additional we could just uh, tell you right away without having to delay it or whatever so what what's next for you both uh i mean what kinds of things are you thinking about researching in the future or you know, johannes you said that you've graduated uh, you know uh you're you moving on to the workplace or, or what's up 
At, yeah, I'm currently uh, independent and uh, I'm just playing around a little bit uh, for the moment and also trying other things like completely outside uh, this realm of uh, security research. Um, and at some point I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, perhaps look for uh, a, a position, but um, I'm also looking in to see what I can do with my own ideas and uh, see what, what, what it will develop into. But um, um yeah i think I, I think i spent a lot of time on x86 now so i think uh, it would be uh it's about time to uh, give uh, some attention and love to the all these different arm uh, implementations <laughs> because that's a huge pile of slightly different microarchitectures yeah. for so many different devices so there's a lot of things to look into there awesome yeah, and, uh, as, sorry. Uh, so as we've seen, unfortunately, Spectre is not yet fixed, and uh, we will certainly look a bit further if we can find anything else. And as Johanna said, also in other architectures, because they were not yet looked into that well. So yeah. It's always great to work with researchers on tough problems. So thanks to Sandros and Johannes for joining us today. The result of this research is that Intel has uh, strengthened our Spectre v2 mitigations through a microcode patch. Yes, our mitigation continued to provide protections for the broader spectrum of Spectre v2 attack and now cover this new one as well. Yes, it does. So that's it for this episode of Chips and Salsa. We want to thank uh, Sandro and Johannes for joining us. And thank you, Priya. And thank you for watching. See you all next time.